And I guess what I what I view from the perspective of there will always be emergent issues, always, every day. <laughs> Some of them span into the realm of human rights. Some of them span into the realm of equity. Some of them span into the realm of climate. Some of them span into the realm of uh, adverse impact onto residents that we represent in this municipality or in our particular ward or by nature of who we are as individuals. And I believe inherently in the right uh, and the role of councils, uh, councillors, elected representatives to advocate and so if part of our role is advocacy on behalf of the residents that we represent, some of that advocacy is gonna be needed to be directed towards other levels of government as previously identified by my colleagues. But sometimes it's also uh, just in general making a statement because it is critically important, I think in a previous or a, a upcoming slide about not remaining as bystanders yep. on an issue that we have an obligation uh, in moments as an expectation by our residents that we speak up when something happens and not necessarily wait until the next round or committee meetings and the next cycle of council for council as a whole to take a position on an incident. So I think it's really important to have this conversation. I think it's really key to get clear around what is an emergent stance uh, what is advocacy? What is the role of making public statements versus the expectation of speaking to other for, uh, levels of government based on a policy position of the municipality? I think there's some distinctions there that are worth contemplating and getting clear about so um, everybody around this horseshoe is consistent in our approaches if uh, we, we choose to engage that way. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Nan. Integrity Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is a, an important yeah. point, but also a couple of things that are maybe a little bit conflated, and I wanna pull them apart a little bit. So, and I, I think one of the sets of slides that we're not gonna have here before us today are talking about council's role and council staff relations, because you will recall that um, that was assigned to staff. We were asked not to engage in that area. We were asked to leave that to staff. So trusting that if there's opportunities, we can certainly support staff on some engagement there. But let me just say briefly, your primary role is certainly not to advocate for your constituents. You have a number of roles. One of them is as a representative of your constituents. And in that regard, we urge you to think of yourself as a conduit for your constituents to engage with the city on whatever issues they have. You have a full, robust professional staff. You are a conduit for, for that. Council may advocate, but individually that's not really a key role. If you look at the Municipal Act, one of the key roles is stewardship of the municipality through the administration. Another key role is setting policy, procedures. Your, your professional staff do the operational pieces and you individually are not actually under the legislation bestowed an advocacy role. It's not one of the key roles of an elected official. You may be an advocate in some regards for certain issues, and I'm not saying that people don't advocate for things they believe in. Absolutely they do, but that's not your primary role around this table for which you were elected. So hopefully there's a bit of training around council staff relations, and the key about council staff relations is it's not about harassment. We can talk about that. That fits into code of conduct. Oh, sorry, talk with my hands. Um, Respectful workplace, harassment, that kind of thing fits in code of conduct. Council staff relations is how council engages, how it fulfills its role and where it lands when it comes into the organization, who it can engage with or how it brings its constituents' needs to the attention of administration. So that's a separate conversation. But the idea that you are elected to advocate might need some correction that really is not the primary role or even a key role of a municipal elected official. 
although you may indeed feel like advocates. It's problematic, but you're a governing body. So, uh, having said that, so that's why it's probably really important when you have an issue, you bring it to this table to seek council support around something that you may be, and you may have to wait a cycle in order to do that. So that's really not today's topic. That's council staff relations and those kinds of governance issues, and I'm sure you've got them in hand, but you may have to wait. And sometimes it's just good to take that breath, maybe talk to some of your colleagues about the issue you want to bring forward and advocate as a group. It's a council decision to do those things. But as I say to Councillor Clark, I don't want to make a hard and fast rule you can never reach out. But as a general rule, it should align with what council's view is, and it really should be the mayor who's the spokesperson on issues when you're you know, engaging with upper levels of government. Um, I don't want to belabor that. Just a supplemental on that one. Um, I think maybe the clarity that I was trying to bring is if there is an incident, let's say a hate-based incident uh, that occurs in your ward, of course there is the opportunity for everybody around this council and especially the mayor to make a, make a statement, uh, to release a statement. We do it all the time to uh, media, through our social media channels, directly to our residents in the form of a letter. Uh, a, a clear statement um, as an elected official about a particular incident or emerging um, impact as a result of something. So I think of the climate emergency, I think about hate, I think about various other incidences uh, that occur regularly throughout a committee. And I think it's that's when I view that as advocacy. I view writing a statement as direct advocacy and representation of the values that I want to uphold as an elected representative for my community in my ward, but also citywide. I think that's different than what you're talking about. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Nan. Uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson. Thank you. I, I, um, I really appreciate Councillor Nan's questions. Um, and if I could just clarify, and I, I want to provide the context. I think it's similar to Councillor Nan's, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting your counsel. Um, in this re-education, which is mine, both as a, a resident and as a council member, I am coming to realize that there are certain systems and decision-making processes um, that sometimes have been used or could be used to prolong those who have existing influence. Um, and sometimes, not suggesting anything untowards, procedure can be used to preclude um, a variation of information from coming forward. So that is which uh, that's what I'm struggling with because this, this body, both uh, particularly last term, and we're seeing it in uh, discussions about the Board of Health. We've seen it in terms of um, appointments to um, overview the appointments to other bodies, that there are members of our community who do not see their circumstances and themselves reflected in these procedures and in these bodies. So I am uh, trying to understand again, it is not our role to advocate, but I do think those of us who feel that actually the health and longevity of these institutions depends on their ability to evolve. And if they fail to evolve, we're actually in a whole bunch of trouble because then they're not seen to be legitimate. And that le leaves us with actually worse options. So I'm uh, struggling with this idea of everything has to be procedurally and policy-wise uh, at, the, at, at the direction of council versus what I think I'm hearing at the end of the table of um, those of us do believe on matters of human rights, so I'll only suggest myself, uh, have a certain obligation when we're speaking to an issue that in fact may be counter 
um, to the majority of council. And in the absence of speaking to it, it will never be able to be sounded because it is not the lived experience of the majority who, can, who may not represent the community to bring that forward. And that, that, therein lies my tension as a, as a steward um, in these matters. And I, it's not a question, I'm just sharing with you. And I'm trying to understand, I hope what you're saying is there is a continuum of, of, um, of uh, platforms perhaps in which we can express what we feel is our obligation as elected members. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor uh, Wilson. Councillor Alex, well, can I just can I just be, uh, beg your indulgence for a moment? Because I was thinking about what Councillor Danko was asking and Councillor Clark, the idea that we have our opinions and our values and the work that we do when things come to Council and Council makes a decision, your obligation is to speak with one voice as, as a Council, but up until that time, having dialogue in community is not is not something that's problematic. Am I correct in that? Through the mayor, yes. That's Thank correct. You. Thank you. Councillor Alex Wilson, as long as it's not damaging to this to the city as a whole. Right. Apologies. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thanks. That's thanks. helpful. Uh, thanks. And I remove my name from the speaker's list on scribes. So I'm good. Thanks, Councillor uh, Alex Wilson. Councillor Kretsch. Thanks. Uh, I hear a dissonance a little bit in what you're suggesting because um, I'll give you an example and hopefully it makes sense and it's going to come to the point of a question, I promise. Um, we have a deliberation around the council table and we do that in public. So the public can hear us and uh, members of the media may communicate that information that we share. So I may say I disagree strongly with so-and-so, I disagree strongly with the motion, I may fight vociferously against something and I'll say so in public. But uh, I lose that motion, I lose that, you know, I, I'm voting against it, but I lose. Um, I, I can't understand how I couldn't say that again if I wanted to whenever. Like I've said it in public already, right? The public's already reported it, the media's reported it, and so I say so again later. Like I get the council voted against what, I, what my wishes might be or the way I might feel about it, but I don't think it's a problem for me to voice my opinion, is it, on that subject? I just say like, I don't agree, right? And like, I'm, I maintain my opinion, right? As long as I'm not saying like, and council is evil, therefore for doing so, or, or whatever you would consider disparaging to be, I'm free to give my opinion when I wish, I presume. If through the mayor, that's that's great. That's exactly it. You can't be disparaging of your colleagues. You can't be disparaging of the institution. Um, it's fair to disagree, and you disagree before, and you could disagree again. You could say pretty much what you said. Presumably, you're going to be respectful, even if you're vociferous. I mean, we say you could disagree without being disagreeable, and and then you can certainly <laughs> express that outside of the meeting and say, but they they decided this. And that's what the decision of council is. Okay. Thanks all. Continue. Okay. <laughs> all right. Flying can I, right can through. Can I just get a sense of how much uh, longer the presentation you think will be? Six, six slides? About oh, 16 slides. Okay. So Let's I'm going to fly through them. That's so, okay. This is an important conversation and I don't think we is. should short shrift it. So please go ahead. Okay. So um, the respect and non-disparagement uh, really arises from this whole concept of respect in the workplace and um, not engaging in harassing or bullying or intimidating behaviors and that kind of a thing. So uh, you don't have all of this language in your code uh, at this point, but you certainly have reference to some of this language. And it used to be the case back in the day that a complaint about a member of council engaging in harassing behavior would be uh, sent out to a third party investigator and um, by and large that doesn't happen anymore that it goes to the integrity commissioner. Why? Because a third party workplace invest, uh, investigator really can't bring back recommendations that are easily implementable, if you will, if that's a word. Um, they may bring back uh, recommendations that have more to do with employees working in the workplace than a member of council. And in addition to that, uh, the results of that investigation would in all likelihood remain confidential, and this is a process of daylighting, daylighting bad behavior, and we've said to councils before, you have some responsibility to uh, call these things out 
when you're seeing them, at the time you're seeing them. Why do we say that? Not to go outside of the arena and call them out, but and in the context of running the meeting, there's a role for the mayor, there's a role for the chair, whoever's chairing the meeting to say, you know, out of order, councillor, that's out of order. So there are opportunities to correct those behaviours yourselves and it, it lifts council up to do so. Uh, thank you. Uh, councillor Pauls, did you? Yes, I just wanted to question, especially when we talk about respect and respect to our constituents as well. Uh, I don't want to bring this up, but I will because uh, we're all honest here. Uh, when we were dealing with COVID-19, um, we were actually calling the public that did not agree with us names. And I had a lot of emails saying, you know, what's going on? Why should a counselor call people's name? Could that be brought up in front of integrity commission? Saying the public says, I was called names because I did not believe in your policy. <clears throat> what respect do we give to the counselor? Through the mayor, that yes. would depend on the circumstances. It might depend on the name. Uh, it would certainly, it, it might be something that the integrity commissioner would reach out to the counselor and say, you know, you've been accused of calling these individuals these names. Is this something that uh, you would like to walk back? But in the context of COVID-19, there's, that was a very controversial, to say the least, uh, episode. And uh, it certainly, um, we saw a few reports around the province where individuals were called out for engaging in protests and that kind of a thing, but we did not, uh, I don't think we engaged in a whole lot in Hamilton. It might have been something. It would depend on the circumstances, the facts, and the names. I mean, na you know, name calling generally, if, if it's a one-off, and I'll just speak generally, not about <laughs> COVID and that kind of thing, but just generally, we have a kind of a triage process when we get a complaint and we say, look, is it within jurisdiction? Is it something that prima facie would breach the code if the facts were true? And if, even if it is, is it something that warrants a, an investigation? Because that's really, uh, you know, there's got to be a public interest in pursuing an investigation if it's uh, counselor so-and-so rolled his eyes at me, you know. That is not going to warrant, in all likelihood, an investigation. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a question of really resources, right? But if Councillor Smith, right, there's no Councillor Smith here. <laughs> if Councillor Smith, every time a staff member or a member of council or somebody speaks, turns their back, well, if that's persistent behavior, that in itself may give rise to something that requires looking into. It's going to require some course correction. If the mayor or the chair aren't controlling that kind of you know, inappropriate conduct, then certainly the integrity commissioner can be called on to step in to try to control that. And maybe, if need be, call it out through uh, the daylighting of a, a report. But a, it depends again on the name. It depends on if it's a one-off. I mean, there's a whole lot of circumstances, so. Well, yeah, COVID-19 brought out more than just name um, because I was accused of many things as well. So, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Pauls. Okay. Okay, Integrity okay. Commissioner. Flying right through. Conduct respecting staff. So, again, you cannot uh, attempt to compel staff to engage politically. Uh, you can't threaten staff, obviously. This is really about not intimidating or coercing. Uh, staff are neutral, and your staff are very professional, and they're bringing you the best information available. Uh, and you, it, it's improper for, I shouldn't say you, I'm sure you wouldn't do this, but it's improper for an elected official, a member of council, to sit and uh, criticize, disparage, impugn staff's competence, staff's professionalism, staff's integrity. It's improper and it's inappropriate conduct under the code of conduct, so that, that will attract a complaint. Or at least if we had a complaint, it would attract our interest. Um, 
I, I'm sure that you're probably uh, engaging in some training on uh, workplace harassment, but in any case, workplace harassment, it's sort of a continuum, and harassment is really uh, repeated behavior, although a single incident could be sufficient, um, which um, undermines the recipient's psychological or physical integrity and has lasting harmful effect. It's hostile or abusive inappropriate behavior, uh, it might even result in a poisoned work environment. So, I mean, I'm not gonna belabor it, but uh, workplace harassment, you're all uh, expected to engage in a positive, respectful workplace environment, and so there's some provisions around that. At the other end of the extreme is the workplace incivility. You know, the eye roll, the, you know, sneering, or, you know, not engaging with somebody, or, turning away, ignoring them, that kind of a thing. Even, you know, in a workplace, but certainly at council, that's, if left uncorrected, that can really deteriorate quickly. And everybody will kind of see the bar lower and people will behave accordingly. So it's important when it's observed to nip it in the bud and to not sort of call it out and not let it just go unnoticed. Um, these are sort of just general, not to say this is how you're conducting yourselves at all. Um, but these things can have a real impact on the workplace environment, including council having an impact on the ability of the organization to attract and retain good professional staff because you um, are perceived as setting a tone. Uh, this flying right through here. So building the culture, so it's, it's some of the responsibility falls to you for your personal contact and not condoning inappropriate behavior. So we say there are no innocent bystanders in these situations and if you see it, call it out. And I think we, when we spoke to council uh, bringing a report in the previous term, you know, we, we think council has stepped up significantly and we certainly you know, acknowledge and, and uh, you know, recognize that you are doing a good job in raising the bar for yourselves and for each other, and good for you. Um, so these are just little tips. Uh, be mindful of being respectful, apply the golden rule, of course, you know, uh, would you like to be treated that way? Uh, if it's uh, something that uh, has offended you demonstrates some tolerance, some forbearance. You know, uh, be forgiving. Uh, treat subordinates and colleagues as your equals. I like to say, if not your boss. You know, treat them like your boss. You know, you're working with professional people who are well supported, and you've got your colleagues around the table who all have the best of intentions. So treat each other with that respect and civility. Sometimes if you want to have a difficult conversation, ask permission. You know, counselor, can I ask you can I ask you a tough question? Do you mind? Can I ask you a question? And you know, you're setting the table that I'm trying to have a, a dialogue of trying to engage with you, maybe not at a council meeting, but separately, sidebar. Can I have a conversation with you about something that's been bothering me? Right? There's a way to do it. It doesn't all have to be, you know, publicly done. Uh, media communication, so we kind of blended the typical communications policy which talks about uh, recognizing the decision-making authority of council and not disparaging, et cetera, with social media. We didn't ever set up a separate policy on social media because in most municipalities that too is a continuum, right? Media statements, they're in social media, and press releases, and so it's just a way of communicating. It's another medium. Again, uh, you have to be accurate in information sharing. Uh, even if you disagree, you have to be accurate about how you portray council's decision. Um, and exercise some restraint at social media. So we say you really can't be a journalist because sometimes people arrive at council after an election and they were bloggers or vloggers, bloggers or vloggers. Words our, our grandmothers wouldn't know. But um, and they arrive and they were bloggers, and so legitimately they say, well, you know, can I keep blogging? Well, you know what? You're a member of the governing body now, so you're not editorializing. 
on the governing body, and you're not really free to liberally critique the decisions. You are free to express your views clearly and not be disparaging, but you really want to, you know, be a little bit cautious. Again, it's applying some judgment to go off and vlog after every meeting. And so I think we, that's why we say you can't really be a journalist and a member of council. That's not to say you can't get on social media, and so many more councillors do now. I mean, when we did this kind of training uh, in 2018, I think lots of councillors, their eyes glazed over when we mentioned social media, and now I doubt there's anybody around the table who doesn't engage on social media. It's just the nature of the times we've come through. But still, you need to apply some caution, some judgment. One of the things we say is have your own policy. Um, we can provide you some uh, contacts or some text to assist in that. Uh, we're not really, we don't want to own everybody's policies, but what do we mean by that? Do you have to have like a 20 page document? No, but if you have, if you're engaging on social media actively, maybe let it be known that, you know, here are things that will not be tolerated and if you engage in this, you know, offensive, racist, hostile, aggressive, whatever, uh, you may be blocked or muted. Now, you may want to say you'll get, I'll, I'll reach out to you and say I'm gonna block you if you don't take that down, that kind of thing. We think it's fair, particularly if you're engaging in a way that creates sort of that town square environment where people are coming on and debating political issues. It's important to recognize that you have an obligation to curate what's there because you are going to get, somebody may complain that you know, that really racist comment's been up there for two weeks. It's still there. I asked the councillor to take it down. It's still there. You know, curate a little monitor. If that means that you say, oh, I'm going to go on once or twice a week and I'll remove things that are offensive, or I may reach out to you and say, you need to dial that back or you're going to be blocked or muted. Uh, at the same time, um, you have to recognize that you can't arbitrarily just remove people because they disagreed with you as we will see complaints about that too. If you're actually conducting, and I'm not talking about your, your personal, you know, only my family and my best friends have access to, but basically if, if you've created a social media environment where it's like a town square discussion on here's what council's thinking about, here's what we're doing, you can't just arbitrarily remove. So, um, again, respect for the city's bylaws and policies, self-evident, you can't, encourage disobedience, like, oh, yeah, you have to do this, but don't worry, you could do this instead, right? So you can't dis encourage disobedience. And, of course, there's anti-nepotism policy. You can't supervise family members. You have to follow your own municipal HR practices. This is a provision that exists in our uh, preferred model code. And we think it's helpful. We encourage councils to think about adopting it into their code when we, if we have the opportunity to do some review work with yours, we would suggest this. You can't undermine or work against a council decision. So that doesn't take away any of your rights because the provision actually speaks to, you, you know, you still can raise reconsideration. You still have uh, opportunity to avail yourself of every um, accountability officer, or an appeal mechanism, etc. But what this prevents, and it may never come to pass in Hamilton, but what this prevents is at the conclusion of, let's say, a ward boundary review, which is a huge, prolonged, deliberative, and often very heavily debated and controversial planning process, really. At the conclusion of that, when council makes a decision, and this is our <coughs> ward boundaries that we're going to have, a single member of council goes off and takes it to what used to be the OMB, then was the LPAT, and now is the OLT. So they go off and they are going to fight about something that was already deliberated and fought at council, and they were part of that conversation. And plus, they sat in all the closed meetings, if there were any, on all the legal advice. Now they're going to go off and challenge it, and the municipality is going to pay five or six hundred thousand dollars to defend their ward boundary, if not more. So. This is a rule that says you can't do that because the OLT and the court can't prevent it. They can't say, oh, I'm not gonna hear from you because you're a member of the council that decided this. So this is a rule that helps. 
So anyway, that's why it's there. It's quite specific. Um, and there's a provision that says trying to obstruct the integrity commissioner in the course of an investigation is in and of itself a breach of the rules for good reason. So and we're also reprisals. So retaliating against somebody because they brought a complaint, that also is verboten. This is a provision that r just reconfirms into uh, the code itself that you can comfortably act on that advice of an integrity commissioner and feel bulletproofed for all intents and purposes. The, the only little exception to that I have to just say is if somebody went off to the court with a Municipal Conflict of Interest Act application, which I don't think we're gonna see, but if somebody individually went off to do an application, we can't tie the court's hands but there's a provision right in the MCIA that says the court must consider the advice given by the integrity commissioner. So we think you're basically held harmless if you get the advice and you act on that advice. This is a horrible graphic, uh, which is, looks terrible, but it's really not. So uh, I'll take you down to the, the, the third box down on the left-hand side. That's a sort of a, an important piece of the triage for us. So we get a complaint, we look at whether we have jurisdiction, is it minimal, is it frivolous or vexatious, and then we say, is it in the public interest to pursue? Because it's, it's something that it should be in the public interest if we're gonna pursue it. We shouldn't be chasing every little, you know, somebody looked at me sideways. So that said, if we resolve a matter without a full public recommendation report. We do what's called a disposition letter, and that is a quite a detailed explanation of what the complaint was, what the facts were, what the code provision is or the applicable law is, why we didn't take it further, or how we resolved it to everybody's satisfaction. And we do that so that the complainant, and we give a copy to the respondent member, understand that this is done and here is why and it's all uh, explained, but it's not publicly provided. Uh, and just sort of on that point, uh, in the course of our retainer with you and we've uh, had, uh, Hamilton has uh, been with us since the summer of 2018, so quite a nice stretch. Uh, and we really uh, think it's, it's a very positive relationship. In that period of time, we have provided advice in, on 64 occasions, which we think is very, uh, it really demonstrates a very good understanding of members of council of identifying their own red flags. It's key. So councillors have that obligation to see the red flags and get some advice, uh, and that's when it works best. And we've had 34 complaints, of which six, were taken all the way to a public uh, report. So quick math, 28 were resolved in other ways. So, no. uh, this is our contact information. So as I was saying at the very outset, um, you can call us, but since lots of times we're tied up in things, uh, we suggest that you shoot us an email. This is our email information. And just say, hey, you know, Jeff, Janice, you got a couple of minutes sometime this afternoon or tomorrow, and we'll get back to you. We like to do Zooms. Uh, I was saying before we got started what a benefit Zooms are now that they're kind of commonplace, uh, so much better than a phone call. We like to see each other. So we like to look in each other's eyes. Uh, not Jeff and I. Jeff and I and you. <laughs> And so uh, reach out if you need to. Uh, what we do when we build our advice memorandum is that we try to put the explanation so that if the same issue arises or something just a tiny bit different, you can probably know your own, you know, your own how to govern yourself. So it's, it's like educational so that you actually are learning from that and you'll recognize in future. So, all trying to build a more positive uh, whoop, uh, educational understanding around, around uh, the horseshoe. 
Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much, Integrity Commissioner Atwood. Are there any final questions or comments that people wanted to raise? That was a very detailed and uh, productive conversation. I want to thank you as well as the members of council for, uh, for this time that I think is well, was well spent and well invested. Um, so then we do have the, uh, the receipt of the presentation. Uh, that needs to be uh, moved. The role of, uh, role of the Integrity Commissioner in Code of Conduct and Review of Municipal Conflict of Interest Obligations. Can I have a mover and a seconder to approve the following? Uh, Councillor Huang and Councillor Pauls, uh, that the training presentation respecting the role of the Integrity Commissioner and the Code of Conduct and Review of Municipal Conflict of Interest Obligations be received and B, that training presentation respecting the role of the Integrity Commissioner and the Code of Conduct and Review of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Obligations be publicly released. We've already done that. I don't know that we need Part B, so maybe just Part A. I apologize for that, that, uh, that the presentation uh, be received. So that was moved by Councillor Huang and seconded by Councillor Pauls. Uh, so we could just record our votes, please. On the screen it says private and confidential, but I don't don't believe this meeting was private and confidential, it was in public. No, the, through you, Madam Merritt, the issue is that because the item wasn't listed in public, I have to click on something to get a vote. Oh, so okay. I will have to move it after you. We're waiting for the result of the vote. It did carry, yet yeah, we froze here. It did 16-0. 16-0? Thanks very much, everyone. Can I get a, a motion now to uh, adjourn a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by uh, Councillor Francis. And again, can we have the vote, please? Sixteen zero. That carries sixteen zero. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>